We're going to continue on to start uh, thinking about LU equals F type problems, which are functional boundary value problems. And they're very much like AX equal to B um, in many ways, except L now is a differential operator living on some domain. <coughs> we're going to move into infinite dimensional spaces. And we're going to talk more about one of the solution techniques for this uh, using eigenfunction expansions. And eigenfunction expansions are very much like solving AX equal to B using eigenvector expansions. And so I want to start laying down the foundations for this and seeing how does this work and how do we write down solution representations in terms of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, eigenfunctions, depending upon when you're in a finite dimensional space or infinite dimensional functional space. So we want to start here. So uh, a lot of people have more intuition around linear algebra. So let's just start off with AX equal to B. And let's start thinking about eigenvalues, eigenvectors of A. And in particular, writing down a solution using an eigen decomposition technique. So that's really what this is going to be about. We're looking for solution techniques for what's going to be LU equals to F using the eigen structure that's sitting there in this operator. And the operator here is the matrix A. Okay? So how do we do this? Well, first of all, we've often played around and found eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix. And I suppose here they are. AX uh, equal, uh, AXN equals lambda NXN. So the X of N are the eigenvectors, and the lambda N are its corresponding eigenvalues. And N goes from 1 to N. Now we're assuming here that A is some n by n matrix, right? And, and let's, for, for the moment, just assume that we have um, some Hermitian matrix. In other words, all the eigenvalues will be ordered and distinct, and there'll be n of them, and I have n eigenvectors, right? We, we can always deal with the case when we have degenerate eigenvalues or non-self-adjoint matrices or even uh, uh, other, other kinds of structures in general, you know, you don't, aren't guaranteed to actually have an eigen decomposition because you can have matrices that don't have this. However, let's suppose here that we have these nice properties to the matrix A. Let's just say it's Hermitian so that, in fact, we have this here, this structure. So what, here's the question. What are we going to do with all these eigenvectors and eigenvalues? And we have often used this for use, doing diagonalization of different systems for AX equal to B. And here what I want to start thinking about is how would I represent a solution of AX equal to B in terms of these special eigenvectors, eigenvalues. Okay? And here's how we do it. The idea behind a decomposition is just simply to say, I have these eigenvectors. How about if I form a basis out of them? In other words, a set of orth uh, directions that I want to expand a solution in. And if we're going to use a Hermitian matrix, these would be a set of n orthogonal directions that I can use as a basis for uh, my solution, x. So the idea here is to say x is equal to simply a linear superposition of all these eigenvectors, where the only thing I don't know is the c of n, which is somehow going to be determined by my specific b in the ax equal to b. So I give you a b, and then it's going to determine what those c of n's would have to be in order for me to represent that solution in terms of these eigenvectors. Okay? So that's what we want to focus on. How do we actually get those c of n's then, if we're going to be playing around with this structure. So one important property, and I've already mentioned this, that we're going to think about Hermitian matrices, is they're self-adjoint. Hermitian and self-adjoint mean the same thing. And what that means is I find from my eigenvectors an orthonormal basis set. Now this is very nice. It means that every single eigenvector is orthogonal to all of the other eigenvectors. So essentially I have, when I take a dot product between x of n and x of m, this is equal to the delta chronicer here, which is e 1 when n is equal to m. In other words, when you dot it with itself, it's unit length. And if you dot it with any other eigenvector, it's 0. Okay? So that means you're orthogonal, you have an orth orthonormal basis set, which is always very nice to work with. Okay? And so I'm going to use this orthonormal basis to represent the solution to AX equal to B. And all I'm going to do in doing this is going to rely on two things repeated over and over. 
inner products orthogonality. That's going to be the main tool for solving these time of types of systems is just going to apply the inner product, use the fact that you have orthogonality over and over again to derive your solutions uh, uh, for this problem. So let's go get it. Let's go get this solution. So here it is. We're going to expand. I had AX equal to B. But now remember, x is a sum of all these eigenvectors. So I have a times x equal to b. And the only way to solve this is if, is if I can determine what those c of n's are right, for the specific b. So what are those c of n's? So this is my expansion. This is my eigen decomposition right there. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just take this and take the dot product on both sides on the right with respect to x of m. So I have this sum here from 1 to n, and I take the dot product with respect to m on both sides. Okay? So remember, all I'm, I'm going to tell you this over and over again. You're going to rely on inner products and orthogonality. Took the inner product, and now orthogonality is, orthogonality is going to come to play a role. So first, let me take that A and move it inside. So the matrix A, I'm going to move it inside here into the sum, and so I have a of x of n. But a of x of n is equal, it's an eigenvalue problem, right? So a of x of n is lambda n x of n. So there you go. I have a constant now, another constant here. And now I have just an inner product, or dot product, between x of n and x of m. But this is always 0 unless n is equal to m, and in which case it's 1. Remember, all these are orthogonal to each other. So this dot product here over this sum is always going to be 0 unless n is equal to m, and then it's 1. And that's going to then reduce this to this. So of all this sum here, n, only one term matters. And that's the term. That's when n is equal to m. So I get c of m, lambda m. Remember, the inner product's 1, so I just have this. So this here is the left side of the equation. On the right, nothing ever happened. It's just the inner product of b dotted with x of m. But notice what I can do with this now. I can actually solve for c of m. So take c of m there, just divide by lambda m both sides, and what you find yourself with is the value of those loading coefficients in the eigenfunction decomposition, eigenvector decomposition. So c of m is equal to b dot x of m divided by the eigenvalue lambda of m. So given a vector b on the right-hand side, it uniquely determines the coefficient c of m. Okay? And it's basically a projection of b onto each eigenvector direction divided by the eigenvalue. And that's, that's how you get those coefficients. So your solution overall looks like this then. When I do an eigenfunction expansion, eigenvector expansion solutions, x is equal to, remember, it's just the sum of the eigenvectors, but now the c of n is determined, and there it is. Okay? So this is an eigen, uh, eigen decomposition solution to that problem, x equal to b. You just simply take the right hand side b, you project it onto each of the eigenvector directions, normalize it by the lambda n, and then Project, that's how much is projected into each direction x of n. Okay? So it's a nice solution technique. You use this nice orthonormal basis. It is a way, in some sense, it's a different representation of A inverse. Remember, this is just simply, this is going to be your now solution. So you think about like what x is. x was equal to A inverse B. And so this is a different representation of A inverse B. And you got it in a very different way than just simply doing something like trying to find the actual inverse of the matrix. Okay? So we're going to use this same idea that comes right out of linear algebra and come to solve L equal to F using this Eichen decomposition. As I already talked about in the last lecture, there's all these nice, uh, uh, you know, basically pairings between what happens in, in finite dimensional spaces and eigenvectors or vectors to functional representations, which are infinite dimensional. And so we're going to use this same concepts, basically follow the same routine we did here for solving AX equal to B and solve LU equal to F using this eigen decomposition technique. 
So here's the eigenvalue problem associated with this operator L. So the operator L, you're looking for the eigenfunctions. In other words, LUN equals lambda n u of n. So this here are your eigenfunction uh, solutions. And by the way, now n can go, you, know, you can have an infinite number of eigenfunctions. Okay? That's one of the differences between using matrices and going to these functional representations. One is finite dimensional. The other one is infinite dimensional. And by the way, I should mention they are equivalent. If you were to take this and use some kind of numerical discretization, like finite differences, L u equal to f with finite difference discretization is exactly a x equal to b. And how many points you use to discretize, that is the actual dimension. Instead of inf infinite dimensions, you have then n dimensions, which is the total number of discrete points you used. Okay? So there's this nice equivalency between the two. And so we want to take advantage of this equivalency to say, well, how would I find then a solution uh, to L equals f knowing that if I had some eigenfunctions and eigenvalues given by here? So first of all, if I assume that I have a Hermitian or a self-adjoint operator L, let's start with that for now, then what you find is just like I made the assumption for the uh, matrix A of his Hermitian, you find that you can develop an, uh, an orthonormal basis set out of these eigenfunctions. In other words, you have the inner products between u of n and u of m is equal to the delta Kronecker. And the delta Kronecker tells you that this is 0 everywhere unless n is equal to m and then it's 1. In other words, what you have is an orthonormal basis set. You have an infinite number of directions that are orthogonal. And the inner product, uh, the, the length of an individual eigenfunction is 1. Okay? That's what this tells you. And we're going to make use of this fact, this orthogonality, to get us a solution to L equals F using the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the operator L. So just like before, we just expand. We say u of x is equal to some constant times u of n x. And u of n x are my eigenfunctions. And the only thing I need to then determine is, uh, how do I get these coefficients c of n? The c of n are the only thing left for me to determine. And so let's go and try to figure out how to get those. So first, I take u l. Uh, uh, remember, I'm solving u l equals f. L, L u equals f. L u equals f is here. L times u. So it's L times u now, which is this expansion, equals to f. And I'm going to use the same trick I did before, which is all I'm going to do is take the inner product of this on both sides with respect to u of m. So here you go. I take my L u, which is now given by here, inner product with u of m, is equal to the right-hand side, which was f, f inner product to u of m. Okay, So I have this here. And notice what I can do. I can first take the operator L and move it inside that sum to act on u of n. And that's what I'm going to have here. So I have the L acting on u of n. But remember, this is an eigenvalue problem. So L acting on u of n is lambda n u of n. So this is what you get here. So you get lambda n u of n. So there you go. And so now this is all constants out here. So basically, I'm just taking the inner product with u of n with respect to u of m, which is 0 unless n, the sum, when n is equal to m, this is 1. So this whole infinite sum collapses to a single term. And that is when n is equal to m, that becomes the integral becomes 1. And then you simply get, so there you go, you get this. You can pull out the c of n lambda of n. That thing there just becomes c of m lambda of m. It's 0 everywhere else. Okay, So I have this is equal to that right-hand side. And notice what this allowed me to do now is now I can actually compute the c of m. In fact, the c of m, just divide by lambda of m, is equal to the following. The inner product of f with respect to some I, the eigenfunction m divided by the eigenvalue. This 
follows exactly what I did with the x equal to b case. And so I just want to, again, highlight that everything you learn from your solving ax equal to b and eigenvectors uh, and eigen decompositions there ports right over to this functional representation. And I just did this manipulation in exactly the same way I did for solving ax equal to b using eigenvectors. So my solution then is the following. u of x is equal to an infinite sum, 1 infinity, c of n, u of n, where I just computed the c of n as this here. f, inner product u n, divided by lambda n times the eigenfunction. So all you're doing, basically, is saying, you give me an f, which is l u equals f. You give me that right-hand side function f. I take that f. I project it into an eigenfunction direction. And how do I do that projection? Inner product. Normalized by the eigenvalue, just multiplied by the eigenfunction. And I do this, and it's an infinite sum. And that's your representation. Of course, in practice, if you're doing this computationally, you don't expand to infinity, you cut this off at some you know, sufficient number of, of eigenfunctions to give you good representation within some tolerance. OK, so that's it. That's the whole game in eigenfunction expansions. You find your eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. You, uh, you then say my solution is a sum of those, and then you uh, simply Place that into your problem, L equal to f. Take inner products with respect to the eigenfunctions and get out your solution from there. So you're relying on inner products and orthogonality. And of course, I'm doing self-adjoint operators here, which make it all very easy. And then when you have non-self-adjoint operators or more interesting operators where you don't have all the nice properties of, of these Hermitian operators, things get more interesting. But I just showed you this case for, for simplicity. So let's do it. An example. Let's consider the following operator. LU equals minus UXX. So it's very simple. Equals F of X. OK, so it's a second order operator. And let's have the boundary conditions. U of 0 equals 0. And U of L equals 0. So also very simple boundary conditions. Pinned boundaries at 0. And, and L, the solution is 0. And then it's a second order differential equation in between. So what I need to do. In solving this problem, uh, if I want to do an eigen decomposition, is I have to consider the eigenvalue problem associated with L. So here it is. L equals, uh, L u equals lambda u. This is now it right here. Minus u x x equals lambda u. So that's, that's going to be my uh, linear operator here. And so I'm going to take the lambda, I'm going to take the u of x over. So I get u x x plus lambda u equals 0. So this is what I'm solving. So this is actually very simple to solve. If you look at the form of the solution, sines and cosines are the solutions to this thing. Here they are. u of x equals c1 sine lambda x plus cosine, uh, uh, cosine lambda x. Okay. So those are your solutions. And so when you apply the first boundary condition, which is u of 0, 0, it drops the cosine term out. Okay. So the cosine disappears. Uh, and then when you apply the second uh, boundary condition, which is the function u of l is equal to 0 at l, then you get this kind of condition here. C1 sine lambda, a, sine of, uh, lambda l is equal to 0. Now, the only way this can be 0 is I could take, of course, the coefficient c1 to be 0, which then would tell me all, you know, give me a trivial solution. I'm looking for non-trivial solutions. So the only way to satisfy that is if Lambda L is n pi, where n can be any integer, right? In fact, if it's n pi from n equals from negative infinity to infinity, then I satisfy that second boundary condition. So what you end up having is, uh, and by the way, since sine is symmetric from 1 to minus 1, it's just a minus sign change, I can actually do this. So if lambda L is plus or minus n pi, so n goes from 0 to infinity, those are my eigenvalues. Okay, or they're going to determine my eigenvalues. And so I'm going to put that in now. I've learned something here, which is my solutions are signs where the lambda takes on the n pi over l x. n pi over l is the eigenvalue. And so now what I have is I've discovered the eigenfunction. 
discovered the eigenvalues, and now I can do the eigenfunction expansion here, which is to say, let's expand with c of n sine n pi x over l. Now, there's a couple pieces we still have to finish up, though. The sine n pi x over l, remember when, when I showed you the derivation of the eigen decomposition, I thought about having orthonormal basis set. The length of sine n pi x over l is not 1. So I need to normalize that to make it an orthonormal basis. So the other thing I want to point out is, are these sine functions orthogonal or linearly independent? And I'm going to show you this in two ways. First is to compute what's called the Ronskian. Now, you may have remembered the Ronskian from differential equations. And if you take the Ronskian between two functions and can show that it's not 0, that means these two functions are linearly independent. So I want to really see, is sine n pi x over l linearly independent from sine m pi x over l? What does that mean, right? Because when we think about vectors, you know, it's very easy to get point directions and vector spaces and see that they're orthogonal or if they're at least form an, a basis set that are linearly independent. But in function space, it's a little bit harder to get our heads wrapped around that. So I want to show you what this Ronskian calculation is. The Ronskian between two functions, u of n and u of m, is the first times the derivative of the second minus second derivative of the first. And if you actually compute this all out, and I've given you the computation here. I don't want to go through it too much, except that use a little bit of your trig tricks that you learned from high school. And what you end up with here is the following expression, which is non-zero unless n is equal to m. So basically, you can show this for any pairing of sine, uh, of sine m pi x over l, sine m pi x over l. The Ronskian will never be 0. The only way that can happen is if n is equal to m, right? which means they're the same function. So that's good news. It means if I use these, they are linearly independent. And when I do a, a, want to expand a solution, I want to use linearly independent basis set. But more than that, not only they're linearly independent, I'm going to show you that, in fact, they're orthogonal. So how do I do that? Well, I take the inner product of un, u of m. This is equivalent to a dot product in function space. Right? What we know is when we do two, two vectors and you take the dot product and it's 0, they're orthogonal. Same thing here. I'm going to take the dot product, u of n, u of m, sine m pi x over l, sine m pi x over l. And here, I just used a tr uh, trigonometric expression for the sine of multiplied e with each other. It's cosine of the difference minus cosine of the, of the sum of the angles. And then you can integrate this out. And what you find for yourself is that the integral is 0. It's fantastic. That means n and m, u of n, u of m, are orthogonal functions. And this gets us right to this issue, which is we've talked about orthogonality, but now you're seeing it in practice. Another way to say this, if L, was, let's say, was on the domain of, let's say L was pi, you know, what this is really telling you is something like a function like sine of 2x is orthogonal to sine of 3x, which is orthogonal to sine of 4x. And we're going to have to get used to that concept because uh, you know, normally th these are not vector spaces, these are function spaces, but that is the equivalent of having you know, the x hat direction, the y hat direction, the z hat direction. It is like sine 1x, sine 2x, sine 3x, but now it's infinite dimensional and they are orthogonal. Last thing we need to do, we've shown that they're orth orthogonal. Now we want to show, make them orthonormal. In other words, we want to make them unit length. So to do that, we now look at the inner product with itself, u of n comma u of n. Well, here's what you get. And you can do this integral. It's not a hard integral to do. And this equals L over 2. So that's the length of the vector sine, or the fun function sine m pi x over l. So if I normalize my eigenfunctions to this, then this will be of length 1. And what I do is took the square root of 1 over that. So it's square root 2 over l sine m pi x over l. And now if I took the inner product of this function with itself, the inner product would be 1. Okay. So now I have orthogonality established and orthonormality established by using these eigenfunctions. So I, have, I just showed you this. 
this, this was important. So uh, before I just said, suppose I have some eigenfunctions that satisfy this, but now what I'm showing you this in this specific example is I actually constructed the eigenfunctions that satisfy this. They are orthogonal, they are orthonormal, and I can use them as a basis set and I have this property holding, which means I can use the solution I had, which was exactly this here. My eigenfunction expansions to L equals F is U of X is equal to a sum over all those eigenfunctions, where the C of N is given by the inner product of F, UN over lambda N, and then there's the UN there. And in this specific case, the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues are given by here. The eigenfunctions are normalized, so it's square root 2 over L, sine n pi x over L, and the eigenvalues are n pi over L. That's it. That's all you need to have in this problem. And so now you give me a generic F, and if you want the solution to L equals F, you just basically compute its inner product with respect to these eigenfunctions, normalized by the eigenvalues for each different direction. In other words, sine, you know, sine 1x, sine 2x, sine 3x. You project in each direction, sum it up, and there is your solution to L equals f. In other words, another way to say this is when we started talking about L equals f, we talked about L. I want to find the inverse operator. U is equal to L inverse f. And essentially what I've given you here is one form of that inverse, which is this eigenfunction expansion solution. So that kind of uh, gives you an idea of how to use eigen functions and eigenvalues to represent solutions. It is one of the methods we can use to uh, find solutions to these boundary value problems. And it's very commonly used, especially when you have a lot of these uh, Sturm-Louville type problems that come out of the engineering sciences. Uh, and so this technique of eigenfunction expansion has become, is sort of this traditionally very powerful method that we use uh, uh, because it gives you a lot of interpretability, gives you a flexible architecture, and um, very uh, and a nice solution technique.